Hello friends, my name's Ty and I'm going to read to you. Today's selection is a short story called Beneath Lock and Key. Here we go. Look, man, I don't care who you are, Sergeant Joe Kane said as he looked across the counter at the lean man in the tailored suit. The guy you're looking for isn't here. You can't prevent me from seeing my client, the man said and ran a hand over his slick hair. I'll sue you and your whole department into the welfare line. No one is trying to prevent you from anything, Joe said. The guy isn't here. Our cell block is empty. I can't let you see someone who isn't here. I believe you are mistaken, Sergeant, the man said, and reached into the interior pocket of his suit jacket and produced a business card with a flourish. See that you call me as soon as you, as you come to your senses and decide to preserve your stupid little job. Look, I'm retiring in... Joe looked at his watch. Seven hours. So you can chase my job all you want. What did you say your client's name was, Mr... He looked down at the card without touching it. Smith? You will know him when you see him, the lawyer said, and dropped the business card on the counter. And when I return, you will be sorry. The man turned on his heel with the polished shoe he was wearing and pushed through the front door of the small police station. I'll be sorry because you're an asshole, Joe said. Turning from the desk, Joe rubbed a hand over his face and glanced at his watch again. Six hours and 54 minutes left to go. That's what a 30-year policing career came down to, counting down the hours of his last shift, dealing with assholes at the front counter. Sergeant Kane, to the cell block, please, a voice of the city dispatcher said over the PA system. Sighing again, Joe started towards the hallway that led to the back of the building, where the small cluster of jail cells were located. Before he got too far, he stopped and turned, and picked up the slick lawyer's business card from the front counter. He held it for only a moment, then dropped it again. Despite the luxurious appearance of the expensive card stock it was printed on, it had a rough, greasy feel to it. It was as slick and shiny as the lawyer himself had been on the surface, but there was something about it that made Joe's fingers feel raw, and he wiped them at his uniform shirt as he walked towards the cell block. What have you got, Wayne? Joe asked as he pushed open the steel door that led from the office into the cell block. Wayne Davis held a slim man by the elbow, hands cuffed behind his back, and got him up to the booking counter. A shoplifter, Wayne said as he dropped a clear evidence bag containing a chocolate bar and a bottle of suntan lotion on, on the concrete counter. Pausing in the act of opening the prisoner ledger, Joe looked up at the prisoner. The slim man had a contented smile on his unremarkable face, and his gray eyes were fixed on Joe's. Joe looked over at Wayne and did his best to look incredulous. You're holding a guy for shoplifting? Does he have a history? Wayne shook his head. Not a thing. Then why am I standing here with this dumb look on my face? I tried to let him go, Wayne said, looking at the slim man who was still grinning. The store detective at the mall called to report this guy had stolen a chocolate bar, but didn't want to pursue charges as wanted the guy to talk to. Yeah, Joe said, and looking between the officer and the prisoner. And... After I let him go, Wayne said, he walked back into the store, grabbed a bottle of suntan lotion off the display by the door, and waved at me as he walked away. Why did you do that? Joe asked the prisoner. The man shrugged. I didn't want to get a sunburn. Uh, it's November, Joe said, pointing at a calendar on the wall. And it's dark outside. Never can be too careful, the prisoner said, his grin getting a little wider. That's not it, Sarge, Wayne said. I arrested him, gave him an appearance documents, and told him to go home. So he we went back inside the store, grabbed a whole rack of scented candles, and started running. Wayne hitched up his gun belt. At that point, I figured he was just fucking with me, so I brought him here to prevent the continuation of the offense. You were pretty insistent on coming to jail tonight, weren't you? Joe asked. The prisoner shrugged his narrow shoulders again. No safer place than beneath lock and key in a jailhouse, is there? If you say so, Joe said, and continued making the appropriate entry in the prisoner log. Wayne uncuffed the man, got him stripped down to one layer of clothing, and handed Joe a tattered driver's license. Wisdom Carter, Joe read the name off the driver's license and looked up from the ledger. Your name is Wisdom? The prisoner held up his hands in a helpless gesture. My parents were ridiculous hippies. I have no defense. Any valuables, Joe asked. His wallet is empty, Wayne said. The only th other thing I found on him was this. Joe looked up as Wayne set a he something heavy down on the counter with a loud clunk. It was a skeleton key, 
as long as Joe's open hand, with a barrel about as big around as his thumb. The head was made up of a complicated pattern of three-dimensional squares, and it made Joe's eyes hurt to look at it. Do you have a safe for valuables, Sergeant? Wisdom Carter asked. We do, Joe said, picking up the key with one hand and rubbing his eyes with the other. I'd like to insist that get locked up, then. Joe shrugged his heavy shoulders and picked up a brown envelope from another counter. He wrote Wisdom's prisoner number on the envelope, then slipped the key inside. He feared he had the beginnings of a migraine coming, with the ache in his eyes, but the headache disappeared as soon as the key was out of sight. He rubbed his eyes again and shook his head. He looked up at the prisoner, whose grin had faltered a little, and cleared his throat. Um, what's the approximate value? Joe asked. Mm, priceless, Wisdom said, his grin returning. Right, Joe said, letting out an exasperated sigh. Put him in cell number three. Uh, Sergeant? Wisdom asked, as Wayne pointed him down the hallway towards the vacant cell. What? Uh, how long do you think I'll be here? Joe looked up the clock above the door to the cell block. It was just after eleven. Uh, you'll go before a judge a little after nine in the morning. So it will be daylight when I'm taken from this cell? The prisoner sounded hopeful. Yeah, it should be, Joe said. Wisdom Carter's grin got even wider. That is very good news. He turned, without further comment, and walked into the cell that Wayne pointed out for him. Joe took the key off the counter and went to the little office attached to the cell block, where he was planning on sitting for a while and thinking about how weird that guy was. As he dropped the key on the desk and was about to sit down, the door leading to the cell block area from the cell block area of the rest of the police station, and another young officer stepped into the concrete floor. He, uh, Sarge, the young man said. You got a guy named Wisdom here? Uh, yeah, Joe said, stepping back to the door and leaning on the frame. Wayne just brought him in. Why? His lawyer just showed up. Says he wants to see his client. Lawyer? What's he look like? The young patrolman shrugged. Looks like he belongs in a TV show, all slicked and primped and such. Looks like he didn't doesn't belong in this town. Made a lot of noise about suing my ass off and such. Ah, fuck, that guy again. Joe said, rubbing his eyes and feeling his headache coming back. Put him in the side room. I'll get Wayne to bring the guy back out. Joe looked down the hallway where Wayne was closing the sliding steel door on the cell now occupied with wisdom. Wayne, that guy's lawyer is here. Wayne pushed the door back open and waved Wisdom out. Looks like your lawyer showed up. The prisoner stood in the doorway of the small cell, and Joe noticed his grin had faded entirely. I don't have a lawyer, Wisdom said. You don't? Joe asked and looked at Wayne. Did you call counsel for him? No, Wayne said, shaking his head. He said he didn't need a lawyer, and I didn't call. Wisdom began dry washing his hands, looking nervously at the exits. Sergeant, I really must insist you do not let anyone to see me. I can assure you, whoever they are, I did not call for them. After spending over 30 years as a cop, Joe had a fairly good radar for fuckery, and this current batch of ridiculousness reeked of it. If you didn't call this guy, then who is he? I really do not care to find out, Wisdom said. The door out to the main office opened again, and the nameless patrolman put his head back in. The guy's in the side room waiting for Wisdom, Sarge. He appeared to think about that for a second, then snickered. Joe looked to the left of the lawyer room. A small booth with a door that extended into the cell block and another gave access from the main office, with a counter and two chairs separated by a sheet of inch-thick plexiglass. In the lawyer's side of the booth stood the slick man from the front counter, a wide, toothy grin on his face. He stared past Joe to where Wisdom was standing. When the prisoner saw him, saw the man in the lawyer room, he began backing up. He should not be here, Wisdom said. He is not what he says he is. His scalp set to tingling, Joe settled his hand on the, bat the butt of his pistol on his hip. Don't say that, Wisdom, the man in the suit said. We are friends, you and I. We can help each other. There is no need for it to be like this. The lawyer moved his eyes from Wisdom and on to Joe. You, he said to Joe. Let me in so I can talk to my friend. There was something wrong with the lawyer's eyes, Joe thought as he looked. There was too much pupil. It made them look all black. And meeting them made Joe's eyes hurt the same way it had when he looked at the key. Sergeant, Wisdom said, 
No matter what he tells you, do not let him in here. It will be the death of us all. Let me in, the lawyer said again, his eyes locked on Joe's face. Joe looked away, but the man's stare was so intense it felt like two fingers were poking him in the cheek, and his skin felt greasy, like the man's gaze were leaving a fine coating of oil. Get that guy out of here, Joe said, fear making his voice take on a mewling note he didn't care for. The patrolman shook, in, shook his head, not looking at Joe. Let me in, the lawyer repeated, a little louder, a little more insistent. The sound hit Joe's ears like a hot needle, and he laid the flats of his palms against them to block out the sound. The lawyer's eyes got wider, and his pupils seemed to grow until the whites were taken over completely. Let me in, he said, and lifted one fist to hammer against the glass. The blow was so hard Joe could feel the vibration of the concrete beneath his feet. Let me in, the lawyer said again. He pounded his fist against the glass once more and a huge diagonal crack appeared in the clear surface. Joe had seen men three times the lawyer's size beat on that glass with fists like engine blocks and hardly make it shake. Sergeant, Joe looked down to see Wisdom Carter standing beside him. The unremarkable man reached out and touched the bare skin of Joe's hand, just a brush of his fingers. With that touch, the terrible fear Joe felt at the sight of the lawyer, with his black eyes and awful voice, did not disappear, but it slackened. Joe's faculties returned enough for him to remember he was armed and standing in his own house, the place he had spent most of his adult life, while some freak in an expensive suit tried to ruin it. He yanked his pistol, a forty caliber Glock, from the holster and leveled the sights at the lawyer's forehead. Who is this guy? he asked Wisdom, without taking his eyes from the lawyer, who hammered both fists against the glass barrier, turning the crack into a great fissure. I can't say for sure, but he and his kind want that key I brought in, and I have every intent to keep it from them. Give me the key and let me go. I will draw the creature away. Joe was thinking about doing just that when the lawyer hammered his fist against the glass again and it burst, flying from the frame in jagged shards. The man, or whatever it was, hopped over the small counter below the twisted frame as easily as Joe might step over a sleeping dog and walked into the cell block. Where is the key? the lawyer asked, a smile that was a little too wide dragging at the corners of his mouth. By way of answer, Joe pulled the trigger on his pistol and the cell block was filled with the echoing crash of gunfire. Joe was a hell of a shot, and even scared, as he was, the bullet slammed in the center of the lawyer's chest. The thing staggered but did not fall down, and looked at the bullet hole. Joe got a little more nervous when he realized the bullet wound was not bleeding. Let's be reasonable about this, Sergeant, the lawyer said. Its voice had changed from its slick drawl use of the front counter to something just this side of a growl. Give me wisdom. Give me the key, and I'll let you and your men live. Continue to resist me, and I'll make you suffer before you die. You cannot believe anything it says, Wisdom said. Unless it tells you it's going to kill you, that will be the truth. I don't need you to tell me that, Joe said, tightening his grip on his pistol. After 30 years of being a cop, Joe had clearly established lines of right and wrong, of things he would tolerate and things that needed to put his heel on. He knew this lawyer, this thing, in front of him was bad, and if it wanted something, Joe was disinclined to let it have it. We need to get out of here, Joe said, his voice pitched low. Can you call for help? Wisdom asked. Joe shook his head. Only the three of us work in this late at night, and the radios don't work in here anyway. He glanced at the door leading to the main office. You saw that young patrolman had fled. Sorry. He glanced at the door leading to the main office and saw the young patrolman had fled. He looked for Wayne and saw him hiding beneath the desk in the small office. He didn't anticipate much aid coming from either source. The only help we'll get is what we give ourselves, he said. We cannot leave the key, Wisdom whispered. Taking one hand from his pistol, Joe pulled a ring of keys from his belt and held them out to Wisdom. The key with the chrome coating on it will open the exit door at the rear of the cell block. I want you to hold it open for me, understand? I do, Wisdom said. Good, get ready. Joe flicked his eyes from Wayne's shivering form to the lawyer and then back to the office to settle on the brown envelope containing Wisdom's strange key. The lawyer followed Joe's, Joe's gaze and his awful smile grew a little wider. Ah, the creature purred and started towards the tiny office. As the thing began to move, so did Joe. He took two quick steps and fired several quick shots at the lawyer, 
aiming for its head. The thing roared and threw up an arm in front of its face, then lost its balance and tumbled to the floor. The repeated gunfire battered ear Joe's ears so badly it made him dizzy, and he made a staggering lunge into the door of the office and snatched the brown envelope off the desk. Wayne, Joe hissed, his own voice hollow in his ears, after the cacophony of the gunshots. Get up. The young man's only response was to try and call further under the desk. Joe looked out the door of the office and saw the lawyer was slowly getting to its feet. The thing's face was a jagged ruin. Much of the left side of its face had been blown away, and the left eye was completely gone. The remaining eye, though, fixed on Joe, and it was red with hatred. He spared a quick glance down at Wayne, but gave up any idea of getting the young man on his feet. Joe's only hope was that this lawyer thing would follow him and wisdom and leave Wayne alone. Joe ran from the little office, firing shots at the lawyer as he went. Wisdom Carter was waiting at the rear door of the cell block, holding, the, holding it open as they had agreed, his remark, unremarkable face pale. Go! Joe shouted as he got close. Wisdom obeyed and fled through the door. Joe had to turn sideways, but he managed to slip through and glanced back to see the lawyer sprinting down the hallway with unnatural speed. The heavy steel door slammed shut, locking automatically, and Joe shrugged his shoulders as he heard a heavy body hit the door so hard the wall shuddered. Do you have the key? Wisdom asked. Joe tossed it to him, then pulled the radio from his belt with his now empty hand. He keyed the transmit button and expected to hear a brief beep, meaning he had the channel and was able to talk, but all he heard was a blast of static. He tried again with the same result. Behind him, he could hear howling and a frantic hammering at the cell block door. Damn it, Joe said, futilely shaking the radio. This thing should work out here. He dropped his radio back into the pouch on his belt and put his cellular phone from the pocket of his uniform shirt. There was a little X at the top of the screen, indicating he had no service. What the fuck? He cursed, staring at his phone. How did I manage to break every communication device all at once? Your devices are not broken, Sergeant, Wisdom said. It is them. He lifted his, his chin towards the cell block. Them? Joe asked. What do you mean, them? Are there more of those things? He dropped the nearly empty magazine from his pistol, pulled a new one from his belt, and jammed it into the grip of the gun. Yes, Wisdom said. Many more. And if they get their hands on this key, he lifted the envelope. They will soon be countless in their number. Okay, Joe said. This key. What is it, the, what it, was, what is it about this fucking key? What is it for? The key opens a gate, Sergeant. But not the kind of gate that wards your house. It is a gate between worlds. Ours and the one that thing came from. Worlds? What worlds? You mean, like, Mars? It is difficult to explain, Wisdom said, looking at the sky. Allow me to put it like this. I am speaking of a world that exists right next to ours, but you could never reach it. No matter how far you flew or how long you traveled, it could only be reached through certain gates, and this key will open one of them. Joe opened his mouth to ask another question, then paused. Do you hear that? Wisdom cocked his head. I hear nothing. Exactly. That means the lawyer isn't pounding on the door anymore. He's figured another way out. We must run. Do you have a vehicle? Yeah, Joe said and jammed his pistol back into the holster while he broke into a trot and ran away from the building and towards the wide parking lot. He ran up to an almost new Chevy Tahoe that had supervisor on the side. He slowed and dug a set of keys from his pocket and then hit the button on the fob to unlock the door. Get in, he said to Wisdom, and climbed on the driver's side. As Joe closed his door and started the ignition, the door leading to the office to the parking lot crashed open and a broad figure was silhouetted in the light of the doorway. Sergeant, Wisdom said, his voice rising on both pitch and volume, I really must insist you use some speed in our escape. Joe dropped the big vehicle into drive and hammered on the gas, cranking the wheel towards the parking lot exit. The creature surged away from the doorway and charged at the vehicle much faster than any man could run. They'd almost reached the street when Joe felt a rear impact and the truck rocked alarmingly. The back window exploded inwards and Joe and Wisdom were showered with broken glass. Holy fuck! Joe yelled as he looked in the rearview mirror and saw the lawyer crawling into the back of the truck. Guiding the rocking truck onto the street, Joe pushed his foot down on the accelerator as hard as he could and the big vehicle roared and leapt forward. In the back seat, the lawyer's grip slipped a little, and Joe pulled his pistol from the holster and fired into the angry, snarling face. The heavy bullet smashed into the lawyer thing and knocked it loose, sending it tumbling into the street. In the rearview mirror, Joe saw it immediately get up and begin running after them. Okay, Joe said, urging the vehicle to even greater speed. 
Now what? There is a, a place I can dispose of the key, Wisdom said, and it is near here. Right, Joe said. Where is it? The problem, Sergeant, is I'm not quite sure. Great, Joe said, rolling his eyes. Do you have any idea? Anything? I've been traveling many years, bearing that key, always just one step ahead of things like that. He jerked his thumb towards the back window. A very important time is upon us. A time where they, those, the gates those things seek can easy, be easily located and open with a key. It is imperative we either keep it away from them until the sun comes up, or destroy it. What are the chances they'll be able to find us if we just keep driving until the sun rises? Joe asked. Wisdom pointed out the windshield. The sides of the road were dark and thick with trees. But in the trees, Joe could see several shapes running parallel to the truck, just, glancing, gl just catching glimpses of them as the headlights hit them. I would say the chances are very good indeed. What about this place where we can get rid of the key? Joe asked. I've worked in this town for 30 years, and if you give me a hint, I can probably find it. I am looking for a place where sorcerers gather, Wisdom said. Like Sorcerer's Reach? What? Wisdom asked. Sorcerer's Reach, Joe said. It's a makeout spot for the local kids in the national park, near the peak of a dormant volcano. He looked over and saw Wisdom smile. Sergeant, I think you might have ended several decades of searching. Joe nodded. Hang on to your ass, then. This is going to be a bumpy ride. He guided the truck away from the marked streets of the town into the rough, narrow roads in the outskirts of the national park. They flew up bumpy roads that quickly turned from pavement to gravel, at speeds that were far too fast to be safe while the trees passed on either side of them in a blur. The figures pursuing them thinned, then disappeared, as Joe pushed the limits of both himself and the truck. The road rapidly grew steep, and he guided the truck, fish tailing on the loose gravel, around treacherous switchbacks and blind corners. Quickly, though, they ran out of road and came up against a wooden barricade. We're here, Joe said, throwing the truck into park and switching off the ignition. He opened his door and slipped out, and Wisdom followed. The moment Wisdom's feet touched the ground, he tilted his head back, a wide, smi a wide smile on his face. Yes, he said, lifting his arms as though he were going to embrace the night. Yes, this is the place I've been looking for. So many long years I've searched, and finally I come to the end of my journey. I don't mean to ruin your moment here, pal, Joe said, drawing his pistol, but maybe we should get on with this before anything catches up to us. Right you are, Sergeant, Wisdom said, pulling the heavy key from the pocket of his coat. We need to get higher. Wisdom ran up a narrow trail, marked by with signs Joe couldn't read in the dark, that eventually led to a broad clearing. The tree stopped abruptly, and the ground beneath Joe's boots turned from the soft mountain loam into hard bedrock. He pulled a flashlight from his belt and shone it into the clearing. It was two dozen steps across, with a dish-shaped center, and on the far side a rocky shelf broke the trees and reached out into the valley. In the daylight, it looked like a massive hand reaching to, into the sky, giving birth to the name Sorcerer's, Sorcerer's Reach. Wisdom walked to the center of the clearing. Yes, this is where the power of this place all comes together. What now? Joe asked, scanning the trees, sweeping his light back and forth. Now comes the hard part, Wisdom said, getting on his knees in the center of the clearing. This will take some time, Sergeant. Please, try to keep them off me. Right, Joe said, and lifted his pistol towards the trees. Wisdom began to chant in a language that Joe had never heard before. Beneath his feet, the ground began to grow warm. Movement at the edge of the clearing brought Joe's attention back up. He saw a furtive shape hunched over and scrabbling, and he fired at it. The shot was answered by a scream, and the shape disappeared. Behind him, an orange glow appeared from the spot where Wisdom was kneeling, and Joe felt heat on his back like he was standing in the noonday sun. More shapes appeared, all snarling and gibbering in the trees, and Joe fired his pistol at them until it locked back, empty. He clamped his flashlight under his arm to free his hand to search for another magazine, but a shape burst from the trees and slammed into him, knocking him from his feet. His pistol flew from his hand, and he tumbled in across the bedrock. Seeing bright spots in his vision, Joe climbed to his knees, then to his feet, and saw the lawyer, the left side of his face still a landscape of bullet holes. Give me the key, Wisdom, the lawyer screamed, so loud it shook the trees. Wisdom didn't look up, but kept chanting as the orange glow bloomed. The lawyer took one shuddering step forward, slowly, as though the orange glow were holding him back, but he was only an arm's length away from Wisdom and was inching closer. Give up! the lawyer shouted. This place belongs to me now! No. 
Joe said as he found his balance and snapped open the folding knife he always kept in his pocket. This is my town, motherfucker. It belongs to me. Joe rushed forward and slammed into the lawyer, jabbing his knife into the, the side of the thing's face. The lawyer ro roared and Joe roared back while he clung to the thing and kept stabbing. Wisdom's voice reached a new height and the orange glow arced into the sky. From the corner of his eye, Joe saw Wisdom fling the key into the center of the glow. An explosion rocked the clearing and, clearing and Joe was hurled from the lawyer. The thing rolled and screamed and was enveloped by orange light. Joe shut his eyes tight and threw an arm across his face as he felt the heat pouring off the creature would cook him alive. Suddenly, the heat and noise were gone. Joe opened his eyes, and through the blinking afterimage in, the, in his sight, he saw the lawyer was gone. The ground it was standing on swept clean. Exhausted, Joe lay back on the rocky ground. So, Sergeant, Wisdom asked as he crawled over and flopped down beside Joe. Any idea how you explain this to your superior? I don't care, Joe said and closed his eyes. I'm retired. That was a fun little story for me to write, and I really hope you guys enjoyed it. If you liked this story, please uh, consider liking the video itself and subscribing to my channel, and I really appreciate it. And once again, thanks for being here with me.